I am in kind of a weird Venn diagram of people who know Elixir, Rust, and WebAssembly. So let me know if you know anyone else who fits in the middle there. Um, and I'm a demo enthusiast. Uh, you're going to see like a little bit of a demo, but I don't have a ton of, a ton of stuff to show you today. So I like to start out talks by saying what I'm going to talk about. I'll start with what is WebAssembly, and then talk about what is Blossom Cloud. Um, talk about the nightmare, which is what we ran into with distributed applications. Uh, and then open telemetry, the implementation, and talk about what's next for us and what's next for uh, you know, what we see for observability. Now, before we get into this, I'm actually pretty curious. Who has heard of WebAssembly before? Nice. That's a pretty good amount. Who's heard of WebAssembly? in the context of running on the server and not in a web browser. Okay, a smaller amount of people. So today, we're going to be talking about WebAssembly in, um, on the server side, not specifically running in the browser. Is this mic OK? I can get a little feedback. Is that fine? All right, cool. So we have this kind of infamous way of introducing WebAssembly as neither web nor assembly, because what it what it started as is a way to run native code like a C program in the browser. It needed to be small, needed to be efficient, needed to be fast, and you know, we want to be able to reuse a bunch of code that we have in current C libraries. But when you look at those aspects for a deployment target, there's a lot of things that are interesting on the server side. We want our services to be rapidly scalable. We want them to be small, and when I say small, a typical WebAssembly module is 20 kilobytes to 200, you know, 300 kilobytes. And we want it to be secure. We want it to run in a deny by default sandbox that gives us security in a way that a lot of cloud native deployments don't give you today. There, there aren't very many, you know, when you deploy things in a, always in a container, there are lots of things that you can kind of pack on top of that, like setcom, like security policies. But WebAssembly starts that from the beginning. Everything is denied by default. It's an open W3C standard, so this is supported by the same organization that kind of puts forward HTML, CSS, JavaScript. You know, the development of the spec is still supported by them. And notably, it's polyglot. So the, the whole neither web nor assembly is, you know, first of all, it's not all for web, but the not assembly is, it's not really like an assembly language that you would write. You write code in the language of your choice, and you compile it to WebAssembly. So, and semi-apt analogy is like the way that Java works. And I know that you know some people may take offense for that analogy, but like you write code in Java, you compile it to Java bytecode, and you run that on the Java VM, right? For WebAssembly, you write code in the language of your choice. The language list is, is constantly growing. You compile it to WebAssembly, and you run it on a WebAssembly runtime. So the WebAssembly part itself is completely architecture and, and operating system agnostic. But even with all the promise, all the great things that I'm saying, there are still pretty large gaps in running WebAssembly on the server side. The language support is really great for some languages, Rust, C, uh, Grain, uh, you know, some things like AssemblyScript, but it's still pretty limited. Things like Java, scripting languages, some, some other compiled languages don't really work quite well with it, but it's still quickly growing. I came from Cloud Native Wasm Day a little bit earlier today, and there's constant language talks about like Python support, Ruby support, things like that. Networking was a huge problem for a while, but it's still, you know, even though you can technically open a socket with WebAssembly, it's still pretty rough around the edges. And uh, you, when you interact with a WebAssembly module from outside, the interaction model is like importing and exporting functions. So it's still pretty rough. When you get down to trying to write a WebAssembly module, and you want to write a hello world, Right, like you add two numbers together, great. You write hello world, and we, as soon as you have to take a string and pass a pointer and a link to read an array of bytes to print out a string, you go like, all right, I'm obviously like this is not the thing that I want to be writing. But everything else is so complicated. Um, you know, all of this is uh, leading up to what I and, and my uh, co maintainer has been working on at Wasm Cloud for the past two, three years. The way that we see the modern computing environment is things are getting smaller and smaller, and more and more complexity is abstracted away from the developer. You know, starting from everything tightly coupled to a PC, to the public cloud with virtual machines, 
And then what much of the world runs on today, which is containers, we're further and further abstracting things away and reducing developer responsibility on these aspects. And of course, there's some nuance to that. But the status quo is you're not worrying about the underlying kernel when you're running a Docker container. You still do have to kind of compile for Linux. And if you want to cross compile like the new AWS for Amazon instances are coming out, if you weren't doing build X before, you do have to compile the ARM for those, right? The way that we see WebAssembly is that creates a completely platform agnostic target. So that now, Developers, they write their code, compile it to WebAssembly, they can run it anywhere, and that reduces their responsibility and the management burden for people who are actually doing DevOps or platform work. Now, Watson Cloud, the project, uh, this is an application runtime, it's focused on distributed computing. So running these WebAssembly modules wherever and seamlessly connecting them, we actually do with a technology called NAS. You may have heard of it, you may have used it as a messaging broker. We're also abstracting away non-functional requirements, or what we call capabilities. So when you think of an application you want to write, um, like a to-do application, your functional requirements are you want to create, read, update, delete to-dos, right? That's the code that, the, the you know, business logic, the code that you as a developer want to get down in writing. It's not the non-functional requirements that you need for your app to work, but it's not code that you're ultimately writing. Your HTTP server library to make sure that you're getting requests. Your key value connector, the library that you're sending, or sorry, sending key value requests back and forth. These are open source projects that you import and then you have to manage, but you haven't actually written that code. And so, you know, this is what, and, and this actually works really fine for a long time. And it's not that complex, but when you see things like vulnerabilities coming out of open source libraries, when a vulnerability happens in a library that isn't your own in open source, you still have to go and update that dependency, recompile your container, redeploy it to prod, and all those things. There are automated tools that certainly make that easier, but wouldn't it be great to design like that from the beginning? Now, <clears throat> I've talked about WebAssembly a little bit, and I'm going to talk about Wasm Cloud and our five different layers of architecture. And I'm just going to preface this that my goal of this talk is not to completely just sell you on like the product that I'm working on. This is all open source in many ways. But I want to lay the foundation because when I talk about the way that we've implemented open telemetry and tracing across our entire stack, it's important because there are a lot of complicated layers. So at the base level, we're running WebAssembly. We run WebAssembly, developers write it, um, and so we're taking advantage of all that platform agnostic um, aspect of WASM. The Wasm Cloud application runtime is written in Elixir and Rust, and it kind of deals with like the orchestration of these WebAssembly modules and connecting them to those non-functional requirements that we call capabilities. And capabilities this is kind of a loaded term. You know, they're, they people talk about capabilities in like a purely academic sense, like access to a single file or access to a single socket as a capability. We mean it in a more like broad contract sense. So. You are coding your you're coding your application in terms of an abstract contract, something like a simple store or a message broker or an event source system. But you don't actually mention a vendor. You don't mention the runtime implementation because you actually can pick that on your local machine. You can code it with Redis. You deploy it abroad in whatever enterprise cloud, whatever you use that key value store instead. It doesn't have to be a Redis one. It can be like an object store that implements key value functionality. This is really important because the move from development to production is still a hugely painful story. I have previously worked at a really large company, a large US financial uh, institution, and uh, oftentimes developers are waiting 15 minutes in the development loop because they make a change in their container, they push it to GitHub, Jenkins picks it up, it builds, it deploys to dev, and then you see if your you know, code actually changed. Right? That's, a, that's a huge pain in the mud, not season on, so I know that it wasn't just me. The composable actors, these are our WebAssembly modules where you implement the functionality of your app. And this is what developers are writing and what's really important for us because that's where the experience is. It needs to be the crisp uh, and, and painless experience. And I'll show you a little code sample to hopefully know this all. And the last part is the lattice network. This is what kind of seamlessly joins all of the compute together no matter where it's physically running. Um, and then this is all enabled by NAS under the hood, so messages, RPC calls are passed back and forth with NAS, it doesn't matter where it's actually running. 
And now Cosmonic, company I work for, building a distributed platform on top of Blossom Cloud. We actually dog food our whole product. I'm giving another talk about that on Wednesday at the main conference, which is fun. Please let me know if you're interested in that. Hope to see you there. But the whole goal is a painless experience for people developing applications. And when you think about tracing and open telemetry and metrics and logging, those all fit into the non-functional requirement piece of an application. So you don't actually need tracing to run you know, your to-do app. But if something goes wrong, it sure would be nice to know where that thing went wrong and how long things are taking to your system. So when we're thinking about this from the perspective of the user, it's a non-functional requirement, and we don't want people to have to deal with that. So a simple Wasm Cloud application, I said a to-do app, right? And, and another popular thing to do is a key value counter. So receive HTTP requests, increment value in key value store, return new value. Pretty basic. The key value counter, this is your WebAssembly module. You write the code like get HTTP requests, return HTTP response, increment value in key value store. The actual code for this is going to look pretty similar to what you may have seen for like function as a service offerings because it's a reactive piece of compute. As a single function, like I said, receive HTTP requests, return HTTP response, and even if you haven't seen Rust before, hopefully this isn't too difficult to grok. You're getting a key value sender, no mention on if this is Redis or you know whatever what have you implementation, and you're incrementing it in the key value store, returning the new uh, value as, as bytes. So when we talk about including tracing for users of the open source or users of our product. We don't want them to have to come in here and add all these like macros and, and derives and, and traits and things to just like, add a span or make sure that they know what's happening with their workloads. So okay, lots of background. Um, you know, I don't want to stop the moment. I'll, I'll keep going. But this is all just in service of, of showing you the developer experience for for Watson Cloud and some of the you know what it looks like to write a WebAssembly app. It's, it's not too uh, not too wacky. Now, I like to talk about what we call the distributed systems nightmare. We send a complicated request across multiple different systems. We expect something to happen. It does not happen. We go find the log. And what does the log say? Error, timeout, right? What, like where is that actually happening? There's nothing, it doesn't give me information. And so, to give a concrete example, one of the things that we do as a platform, Cosmonic, space theme, is we open wormholes for people. You can think of this like an ingress point. When people have like a segmented amount for like a network space, they need to be able to get HTTP requests, so you open a wormhole, ingress point, into their, their network space. So, whenever we do one of these things, we have our API that sends a network request to a WebAssembly module, that sends another network request to another WebAssembly module to actually do the work, Another WebAssembly module picks up that event. We, we use an event source system, but I'm trying not to go down that rabbit hole. And, and actually projects that so that we know the state of the entire system. And when you look at something like this, which to be fair is actually not even super complicated, there are a lot of places that you get error or timeout. It could have come from, right? And, and all of these things could be running on the same machine. All these things could be running on different VMs, different containers. You have no idea where something went wrong. And so, you know, I'm trying to get some mileage out of some memes that I enjoy lately, right? Um, but getting a timeout or getting no responders is so unhelpful and, and you know, spin us, spin us, took us multiple hours of debugging each time this happened just to nail down the, the core issue. What we want is just this. Like, we just want when we send an operation, if it fails, where did it fail? And, I, and you know, Sounds simple, right? Sounds like we would have designed this from the beginning, but we didn't, and you know, here we are. So, implementing this, as I mentioned, the Cosmonic platform runs on top of the on top of Wasm Cloud, which is our open source experience. And so, when we implement it for our platform, we actually go to implement it in the open source, and that's, that's the same thing. Which is a great, um, great consequence of us dog putting our own products because we need that back right into the community. So there are three different kind of components that I talked about. There's the runtime, the capability providers of the actual implementation of, of services, and then the WebAssembly modules. So 
you know, I just took screenshots from COVID's on the review page. In a Litzer, uh, traces are stable. In Rust, traces are stable. WebAssembly, not really, a, not really a concept of doing tracing in WebAssembly. And it's because WebAssembly modules can't actually interact with an outside environment without explicit permission. So it, you can't uh, make network requests, export traces to a URL, or even read a file on disk without explicit permission. Not to mention that the WebAssembly modules are what our developers are writing. We don't want them, we want them to automatically be able to have tracing if they want it and not have to implement it themselves. So just a, a little bit of a closer view into the host architecture. We have our Wasm Cloud OTP, uh, OXR OTP host. That's the thing that's kind of running the web simply. We have implementations of services called providers. And those are Rust binary, so that's actually you know, there's great support for tracing in Rust. So the host itself we can trace, the actual provider we can trace, but the code that developers are writing is a WebAssembly module and can't actually export that. So what we actually did, we have a really thin wrapper, which is an Erlang or a Litzer process, which is super lightweight, not an, uh, not an OS process that actually kind of inspired what Go routines are today, so very lightweight. It wraps the WebAssembly module, listens for RPC calls, and traces them on the way in and the way out. So when we implement this in the open source, Developers actually get that um, kind of tracing for free. So as soon as uh, we implemented it, um, developers can flip the OTEL switch, provide an exporter, and they get all their workloads traced, which is great. Um, going back to the you know a few slides, this piece of code, this is something a developer would write. They upgrade to you know Wasm Cloud version 50, whatever. Um, and then it's automatically traced as long as you provide an export. And none of this code actually needs to change, which is our home goal. But our home goal with how computing should be is that you know to change your non-functional requirements, your logic shouldn't have to change. Should have just included that again. But all right, welcome to Hotel Hotel. Uh, this is when you know I was talking about a specific trace for creating a wormhole or creating an ingress point in somebody's space, right? This is the trace. So we implemented it across all of our different services. You can see, like, what does this one have? Six different services, each changing color here as a network hop. Um, and all the way down the stack, we have a, um, an internal provider called Sauron, which is fun and kind of sees everything, whatever. Um, and you can see the entire flow. And actually, down at the bottom, that, that one. It's probably really small, but you can that one has actually collapsed. This this trace has a, a depth of 81 spins. So when something happens, you go and you you know try to create a wormhole for yourself, and you see this, you get angry. But when you have tracing, you can come back, boom. Where did it fail? You can follow the call stack kind of all the way down. You can see that this request failed because of a no responders issue with NAS, which means there wasn't a service listening on the other side. Super helpful, immediately you can get down to the source of the issue. I know I'm preaching to the choir here because this is Open Observability Day, but we're just so really excited about it because we didn't have this from the beginning, and now I wonder how we ever lived without it, right? Not to mention that this is exactly what people who are developing apps with Wasm Cloud get automatically out of the box. So, you know, when we talk about the amazing trace, the, the kind of uh, inspiration for this talk. There it is. This is the amazing trace. When somebody comes to our platform and clicks login, we're in open developer preview, anybody can come and sign up and, and try it out. We provision them a new account, and that, that includes like giving them a key value bucket, giving them a segment to network space, you know, setting a lot of things up for them so that when they hit the ground, they can hit the ground running. And this is a heck of a trace. We're using Honeycomb. Honeycomb's been great. Um, I'm not saying that we are doing everything perfectly. As much as I'm here to talk, I'm also here to learn. Um, so you know, please feel free to offer suggestions on how to make our tracing things better. But when you look at this, like we're overflowing the CSS of this actual product, right? Just the 
provision any users. So um, anybody here from Honeycomb, let me know. Um, and I look to chat. But this is the kind of thing that if a new person comes on to try our platform and they say, hey, my account didn't like work, like I didn't get an account when I signed up, who's going to want to go try to find where this is? We don't have anything, right? So um, we had a lot of a lot of fun with that. Um, I had something that I feel like I was going to say here, and can't remember. Oh, uh, just that this this spans seven different services and it has a depth of three hundred forty-two traces. Big, again, not saying it's ideal, but it's what we do when we're provisioning a new person. So, like I said, I'm going to try to get some mileage out of a couple memes um, while I'm here. I forgot. Go back to the slides. I'm going to get some mileage out of some memes. I think this is probably the last year that I'm going to be able to use this one before it becomes overused. But talk a lot of good things about open telemetry and was it all great on the implementation side? No, it was actually kind of painful when we got down to doing that. And part of that is because we're retroactively implementing something in our system. And let this be a lesson that I'm going to continue to preach to the choir here. You can start with observability. It's a little easier than doing it later on. So the kind of difficulties that we had in implementation, um, you know, I saw people who are speaking here from Grafana. This is not a fault of you. I think I actually, like, we probably missed it. But we're using Tempo at the time because it's free. It has an open source container. It's really easy to just start up and get working. And at the time, it didn't support discoverable traces. So like. If I go do something and it fails, I had to go back in my logs, find the trace ID, and then search it through that. Like I couldn't actually search through the list of things that happened recently. But someone actually came in from our community and said, hey, that tool actually does have this, at least in a newer version. And so I had to come back and update these slides before, uh, before coming here. Now, on the Elixir side, I was actually kind of surprised. You know, it's, it's all one kind of module. But on the Rust side, we needed tracing, tracing futures to deal with async await boundaries, and tracing subscriber to deal with like formatting. And you know, using this, finding the correct invocation, <coughs> the correct spell to use across the different libraries was actually pretty difficult. And when um, when you think about preserving traces when you're going into async blocks or tasks that are pushed off in the background, it's, it's kind of unintuitive and it takes very deliberate effort to do that correctly. Another pain point is linking spans and, and traces together across network boundaries is difficult. Across language boundaries is difficult. And doing both at the same time requires a lot of consistent um, checking effort, especially across Elixir, which is a dynamically typed language, and like free for all, and Rust, which is a statically typed and very strict language on the compiler. Um, so, so linking them together like that KD counter app that I showed you a little earlier. Getting an HTTP request, trace starts, it's a network request over NAS to go to the WebAssembly module, and then exits the WebAssembly module to go to the key value provider, which is written in Rust. And so, what, uh, two or three network hops and, and two language boundaries? Like, even just the simplest case is, is complicated. Of course, we took on the complexity and it, and it works. It was just something that we had to put a, like, a little consistent effort into. Now, things are great, right? We have uh, tracing implemented in a WebAssembly framework, but there's no tracing within WebAssembly modules at this time. And I think that that's next. We, I talked a lot about keeping the developer experience pure for developers so that when they come in and they want tracing, they provide an exporter and done. But there are legitimate reasons within a single piece of code to want to add multiple spans. We do it at the platform level. Um, developers should have that control initially if, if that's what they want to do. Um, open telemetry logging metrics are things that are kind of like an alpha or not implemented stage in Elixir and Rust. And so that's next for us. As soon as those things come out, we're already dealing with the tracing. Let's add in logging metrics to that too. And uh, just to note, I know that some products have kind of done this recently. Like they release a version of their product, and you run your um, you run your workload using it, or you like it's a new terminal. And they're actually tracing what you're doing, and that can make people pretty uncomfortable. And I mean, it makes me personally uncomfortable. 
Um, we don't actually trace customers for Cosmonic. We have the ability to uh, like supply an exporter URL. The next for us is allowing people to bring their own exporter so that when they run their workloads, they can have their own individual things traced and exported. But it's something that we actually see. Like we, when we're launching the compute for them, we don't enable tracing. We don't we don't like watch over their workloads, things like that. Um, alerting is really important. We love to set up alerting. This is probably again a capability in like Honeycomb or Urban but um, alerting for failed traces and of course sampling. Um, we're at the beginning of our product phase and we're already generating like 200 million events now, 20 million events a month, which is a ton. All right, um, that is about all that I had. So for for some references, right, um, all of Wasm Cloud is open source. Feel free to join our Slack if you're interested in what WebAssembly can do on the server side. You know, come check it out. We're pretty proud of our developer experience. And the capability providers are like implementations where we have traces. Um, and just as kind of a final note, kind of a shameless plug, Cloud Native Wasm Day is today, and my actual whole company is here. We're really excited about Wasm and Cloud Native. We're hosting an event uh, tonight with one of our contemporaries and, and tomorrow kind of a WebAssembly crash course. If anyone is interested in these things, it's free to attend. We will be there and you know, happy to come and, and ask any questions about WebAssembly. Um, I think I have a few, like two or three minutes, so yeah, thank any you. questions too. Thank you first, and I thought. All right, so it's really amazing to see, you know, where observability with the same standards that goes, you know, typical, let's say, for cloud language for servers, goes into, into something such, a, such as what's called assembly, so it's super interesting for me. Any, any questions? Do we have time for a couple minutes? Do you 
Um, yeah, what's your, what's your, what's your future plan? Yeah, so we implemented tracing, right? Great, but that whole like 342 that the like span thing, it, it's obviously not very workable. It's better. We get a lot more observability, but for our whole platform, we need a little bit more specific. Um, we, we need to be able to point to places better than just dropping a span at like each place where it could fail and, and tagging them there. Um, on, you know, other than that, it's, it's down to feedback from the community. People who use Wasm Cloud and, and are used to using tracing, and they're like, hey, this isn't really, you know, it, you guys have it, but it's not really what I'm used to. It's, it's really up to that. Sweet, amazing, thank you. Oh, one question. This is a, to get into the video. Uh, you mentioned at the start that like people don't want to have to run traces and they want it to be automated, but we've also always intentionally written logs and metrics. I'm just curious about like why people think that and why you specifically think that traces are something people will automatically done and they don't want to run them. Yeah, um, so I'll, I'll maybe, is it okay to answer this question? I got this stuff. Um, yeah, go for it. Yeah, um, you know, I, I kind of want to clarify what, what I meant. I don't think that people don't want to write traces. I think they don't want to have to set up the entire system and do the things that we did around, like um, setting up the specific, uh, the, like the right invocation for traces to be exported and connected and all of that. I think people want tracing on their functions, but if they're going to do it, then it should just be a single line, like a log, like how they do an error or info. It should just be like new span, like calling it this, attaching these fields, things like that. Um, so now that we have that, um, you know, that's not a capability for them to be able to use, but like I said, that's on kind of our what's next list. The, the logs that they're using should be attached to the traces um, and not just kind of free form, which is up to like hotel logging. Um, but does that kind of help clarify what, what I'm in? Yeah, and to be fair, like if we had automatic traces, like yeah, whatever, like the trace, it's going to end up with traces. Like we have like a huge thing because it, if we just trace every function call, it's, it's not like useful information. Yeah, sounds like some balance is needed, some high resolution. Yeah, sure. Right, thank you very much.